Bienvenidos a la segunda sesión de diálogos y reflexiones sobre población, ciudad y medio ambiente que organiza el Centro de Estudios Demográficos, Urbanos y Ambientales del Colegio de México. En esta ocasión y en el marco de la celebración de los 50 años del centro, nos congratulamos en tener la presencia del profesor Volvan Lutz, que nos va a dictar una conferencia sobre capital humano global. Welcome, profesor. It's an honor to have you here at the Colegio de México. Eh, esta conferencia va a ser dictada en inglés y no hay traducción simultánea por lo que en esta ocasión mantendremos una dinámica bilingüe a lo largo del evento. Después de la conferencia contaremos con los comentarios que harán los profesores Francisco Alba, Silvia Gerjuli y Marta Mieri Terán, a quienes en su momento presentaré. Eh, después de dichos comentarios abriremos brevemente la sesión al público, a quienes alentamos a que formulen sus cuestionamientos en inglés para una mejor comprensión entre todos. Eh, antes que nada, eh, quisiera permitirle la palabra a la profesora Gerguli, que va a decir unas palabras de bienvenida. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, bienvenidos a esta sesión que se enmarca en las celebraciones de los 50 años del, del centro. Eh, a fin de que nuestros invitados puedan entender, voy a cambiar al inglés, este, una pues, bueno, la, la mención desde antes. And so I'm switching now to English. Uh, I, I would just like to give a brief welcome. I think well, it's a honor, a pleasure, and an opportunity to receive today Wolfgang Lutz and tomorrow that we'll have Sergei Serhoff at the Colegio de Mexi Mexico in the year of our 50th anniversary. This year, and all through the year, we will be celebrating the work that has been done in teaching and researching population, urban and environmental studies here at the center. Uh, in population, which is the center of the presentation that we'll have today with uh, Wolfgang Lutz and tomorrow with Sergei Serhoff, uh, I would like specific, I, I, I like to think specifically about ourselves and our graduate programs as focused in keeping a balance between a strong theoretical disciplinary background with a solid use of tools and methods, the demographic analysis among them and one of the distinctive marks of our daily work. Um, Wolfgang Lutz and Sergei Spitz, it is an opportunity for us, faculty, alumni, students, to keep a dialogue on innovative approaches to emerging issues in the demographic field, such as human capital, intergenerational transfers, and tomorrow aging. Um, I will keep my specific comments on population and education for later. So I would just like to finish this welcoming message thanking Wolfgang and Sergei, who took the time in a very busy agenda to stop in Mexico on their way to Costa Rica. And uh, uh, I hope that this space uh, serves as a as, as potential, well, uh, I, I hope this space opens, uh, opens the opportunity to increase the exchange between our institutions and that it will open the space of future exchange with students and also from future visits from, from both of you. Uh, I would like to thank also Francisco and Marta, former students from our Masters in Demography and now very well-known professors. The three commentators that you will have today are studied the Masters in Demography here at the Colegio, including myself. And I would like to thanks, uh, thank Victor also for coordinating all this. And finally, I would like to say that I'm very pleased to see that we have students from our four graduate programs, students from the Master in Demography, the Master in Urban Studies, the PhD in Population Studies, and the PhD in Population and Environmental Studies. So it, I also would like to welcome them, and, and I'm, I'm happy to see uh, students from all our programs here. And without anything else to say, uh, Victor. Yes, right. now we are going to switch to Spanish, <laughs> to just to present you. <laughs> eh, me voy a permitir presentar al profesor Lutz. Eh, Wolfgang Lutz es director y fundador del Centro Wittgenstein de Demografía y Capital Humano Global, una colaboración entre el International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, la Academia Austriaca de Ciencias y la Universidad de Viena de Economía y Negocios, se unió al IASA en octubre de 1985, en donde actualmente es director del Programa de Población Mundial, POP. Desde 2002 es también director del Instituto de Demografía de Viena, BID, perteneciente a la Academia de Ciencias de Austria, y desde 2008 es catedrático de Estadística Aplicada en la Universidad de Viena. Es profesor asociado en la Escuela Martin Oxford para estudios del siglo XXI. El profesor Luz, Lutz estudió filosofía, teología, matemáticas y estadística en las universidades de Múnich, Viena y Helsinki y tiene un doctorado en demografía de la Universidad de Pensilvania y un segundo doctorado en estadística por la Universidad de Viena. Sus temas de investigación son la demografía de la familia, análisis de la fecundidad, proyecciones de población y la interacción entre población y medio ambiente. 
Ha llevado a cabo una serie de estudios en profundidad sobre las interacciones de población, desarrollo, medio ambiente en México y varios países de África y Asia. También es autor de la serie de proyecciones de población mundial que se producen en el IASA y ha desarrollado métodos para proyectar la educación y el capital humano. Es investigador principal del Metacentro Asiático para la Población y Análisis del Desarrollo Sustentable. Lutz es autor y editor de 28 libros y más de 200 artículos arbitrados, incluyendo 7 en Science y Nature. En 2008, recibió la beca ERC Advanced Grant que otorga la European Research Council. En 2009, recibió el premio Dogan Matei de la Unión Internacional para el Estudio Científico de la Población. Y en 2010, recibió el premio Wittgenstein, la concesión más alta en ciencias que otorga el gobierno austriaco, que es conocido algo así como el Nobel austriaco. Es miembro del Pleno de Derecho de la Academia Austriaca de Ciencias y de la Academia Nacional Alemana de la Poldina, así como miembro de la Comisión de Población de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias de Estados Unidos. So, welcome again, Professor Lutz. The, the microphone is yours. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much both for these kind introductions. I'm very happy to be here at the Colegio. It's my third time, I think, and it's nice to see so many known faces, people I used to know for many years. But it's also a special uh, event now, the anniversary of the establishment of your center, but also it happens to be that this year now Mexico formally joins uh, my institute, this International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, uh, which uh, is comprised now of 22 countries uh, with the national academies of the countries being the members. And um, YASA and Mexico have a, a long and mostly tragic history, I should say. Uh, first, because it's, uh, we are housed in a uh, Habsburg castle outside Vienna, and this was the place where Massimiliano was born, and then unfortunately decided to enter Mexican politics, which uh, ended in disaster. And uh, then in, in 1980, we had a, a very uh, eager and intelligent young scholar there working in the population program, actually in the same office as where we are now, and his name was Donaldo Colosio. And unfortunately, in a way, he also decided to enter Mexican politics, and it also did end tragically in a way. Uh, but uh, this did not encourage uh, our collaboration. Quite the opposite, we have a Colosio Fellowship bringing young Mexican scholars to YASA. We had several uh, members of the Mexican uh, young scientific community participating in our young summer program scientific program at YASA, and as was mentioned, we had uh, collaborations on the research projects on the Yucatan Peninsula and other occasions. And I really hope that now, through this formal membership of Mexico uh, in YASA, uh, the collaboration will be stronger. Now, I have a very ambitious topic, and let me try just to say and outline what I'm going to talk about. First, a few words about what this Wittgenstein Center is about, because it's a rather complex and at the same time innovative construction. Then I will talk about some of the methods that we developed at YASA and that are underlying these human capital projections. It's something that I call following a, a rider, the demographic metabolism and multidimensional demographic models. And then we talk about adding education as a third demographic dimension to age and sex. And I'll show some of the modeling uh, applied to Mexico. Uh, then we'll also talk about the benefits of human capital. And in the end, I will broaden the focus to something that is done at YASA and also has preoccupied my own research agenda for the last years is population and climate change. And I will talk about a new set of scenarios in the context of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that we've recently developed. Well. Uh, this is the logo of the Wittgenstein Center, and it is a collaboration uh, between uh, three pillars, as we say. It is YASA, where I've worked since the 19, early 1980s, and the population program there. Uh, then uh, there is an institute in Vienna by the Austrian Academy of Sciences, which actually is the biggest of the population groups. It's called the Vienna Institute of Demography that has about 30 uh, scientists or from all over Europe mostly, uh, so it's really an international group. And then more recently there is a third group at the Vienna University of Economics, which acts as a big business school, and um, where we now for the second year have started an English language master's program. Uh, it's a broader program on sustainable development, but we have one concentration area on demography 
and uh, population studies. So we'll also have uh, in the future graduates from a master's program in demography in Vienna. Okay, uh, demographic metabolism. It's a, a word that is not very well known to demographers. It was already in 1962, Norman Ryder in his famous paper on the cohort approach has used this. And more recently, I've picked it up last year, there was a special issue of Population and Development Review, which was dedicated uh, to Paul Demann at his retirement. And there I had a paper on, on this topic, and it's really what I try to show here, that this is really a predictive theory of socioeconomic change that we have in demography. And there are not so many theories with predictive power in uh, social sciences in general. And uh, so I think we demographers can be proud of our model that has quite some predictive power. Essentially what it says, it is that the, the change in composition of the population leads to social change. In the way it's what sometimes called the generational change, so new generations enter, move up the age pyramid, and replace the older ones that die off. And then what Ryder focused on the cohort effect, of course, if some characteristics are formed in young age, and these people maintain it as they age and move up the age pyramid, that changes the composition of the population with respect uh, to these uh, characteristics. Well, uh, we will apply this very concretely then in the case of the changing educational composition of the population. And I think that also education, populations change fundamentally, they modernize, they develop as the young, better gener educated generations move up the age period. Now, um, I start with the country in the world that has the most dramatic improvement in education and history together maybe with South Korea and that is Singapore and you will now see many of these colored pyramids. I think it's a very powerful tool. So you're all familiar with the age pyramid where you have women on the right and men on the left and then sorted by age. Here we start only at age 15 because we want to show the educational attainment. So the third dimension here is color and I'll show you some pyramids where we have a four category and others with six. So here it's always red means no education, uh, yellow means primary education only, then the light blue is junior secondary education in this slide, and the dark blue is tertiary. So when I came to Singapore in the year 2000, you see here really uh, two different societies. And I found this out, the young people are among the best educated in the world. Already in 2000, more than half of the young people had university education, more than in almost any other country. Yet, if I have a taxi driver that it was 55 or women out in the street, they didn't speak any English. And you see red, I mean, of the women above the age of 60, 80% had never seen a school from inside. So they learned to read and write somehow later. But you see this dramatic replacement of the uneducated population because Singapore up to 1960 was a desperately poor developing country and these men and women who were then young didn't have a chance to go to school. And then they invested massively in their education and that's how you have this change. And then we, this is what Singapore was reconstructed in 1970. You see there, among women above age 30, almost no women had ever seen a school from inside. And only for the youngest cohort in 70, you see already significant improvements in education. And of course, this is still a pyramid form, uh, and Singapore has now much lower fertility. Now let's say a few words about the notion of human capital. It's generally defined as uh, people. You need the carriers of human capital, so it's the population size and age structure and so on. And then it is the education dimension of the skills they get through education. But it is also health. Of course, people need to be in a good health status. I should also say that the word human capital in some languages is not very much liked because it seems to have the connotation of measuring the value of human beings in monetary terms. And uh, that's, of course, not what is meant here, but, of course, the word capital is sometimes associated with money. And so I sometimes prefer to speak of human resources or the human resource base of societies. Now, when we talk about education, when here I focus mostly on formal education, the health issue is something that Sergei will discuss more tomorrow and that is somewhat harder to measure for all countries in the world on a comparable scale. 
But still in education, we have to distinguish between formal and informal education. Much learning and much acquiring of skills happens in informal settings, in the family, first of all, among peers, on the workplace or whatever. It does not happen in schools. But with the school, formal education is the easiest to measure. There we have the best statistics. But even for formal education, it's important to say we have to distinguish between the quantity, how many years you go to school, and the quality, how good the training is, and particularly for higher education, the content becomes very important. What are you actually learning? And all these three dimensions matter greatly when we uh, look at the consequences of education. Now, when we just focus on formal education, then still it is very important to distinguish between the education flows. That's essentially what happens in school. That's the policy variable. How many people go to school? And that's what so far most economic models have been capturing in statistical ways. But human capital is not the flow. Human capital is the education stock. And the stock changes very slowly and has great momentum, as we've seen from the demographic metabolism. Even if you have massive investments in the education of the young, it takes decades until they move up the age pyramid and the overall human capital of the adult population improves. And again, the stock can be measured uh, through either one indicator, which is the mean years of schooling, which doesn't look at the distribution. Uh, my favorite way of looking at this is to look at the complete distribution by highest educational attainment and age and sex. And then a third way is testing. You have functional literacy. You may have seen recently the OECD has come up with a big skill study where they had tested in all OECD countries uh, the, the literacy of the adult population. And then, of course, the PISA tests in the in-school population also belong to this category. Now, I, I don't think I'm going to spend much time of what we've done. This is going to be a bit more technical demographics. Uh, at YASA, uh, we have reconstructed for all countries in the world consistent patterns of these colored age pyramids, which unfortunately do not exist in a systematic way. Uh, UNESCO has collected from all countries in the world the data they produce from censuses, but from one census year to the next, uh, often the definitions of educational groups changed, and then there are many countries where there are big holes, where for 30 years there's no uh, information, and it's just a highly incoherent and inconsistent database. So what is needed is similar to what the UN Population Division has done with reconstructing the populations by age and sex consistently for all countries in the world. We've done this now uh, for uh, education, by age and sex. And uh, of course, by in doing so, we needed to uh, assume a differential mortality by level of education, because in almost every country in the world, uh, the more educated have a higher survival chance. And also, migration uh, by level of education distorts this picture somewhat. But overall, I think we could uh, come up with a very nice, consistent historical database that we've also checked and validated against empirical data that is available for these countries. Now, we have for each country and each point in time such a, a matrix. That sort of is a numerical information of uh, what the colored age pyramid showed you. You have the age groups, and then you have the education categories. And I'm showing this because most of the analysis by economists of the returns to education, like what is the economic benefit of improving human capital. They only look at one number, and this is this number in the lower right corner. It's the mean years of schooling of the entire adult population, either above age 15 or sometimes above age 25. But this really hides all the distribution. It hides the distribution across the education inequality between the categories, and in particular, the inner cohort changes. Just look at India here. You see Indian men in this case. Uh, that the, the 20 to 24-year-olds, they have on average 7.2 years, mean years of schooling, or so they have not yet completed their education. Whereas if you look at those uh, 60 to 64, they only have 3.6. So if you average over all these age cohorts, you really get losing much of the statistical signal. You want to measure when the economy grows particularly strongly at a time when better educated young cohorts enter the labor force, not the average education overall age groups. Okay, let's uh, 
or the summarize the method of multidimensional population dynamics here in just one graph. You all know the cohort component method of population projection, where from one year or five years into the future, uh, we assume fertility, mortality, and migration rates and make everybody five years older. Well, here if we have uh, heterogeneous population, four educational categories, then we have four different fertility schedules because in almost every society the more educated women have lower fertility rates than the least educated. We have four different mortality schedules for men and women and again here the differences are huge. In some countries such as Russia there's more than 12 years difference in life expectancy between the highest and the lowest education groups. In others like the Mediterranean countries it's more like three or four years only. But infant mortality is also great differences by level of education. So in a multidimensional approach uh, we uh, have this heterogeneity of the population uh, at least by level of education factored in. Now uh, Mexico. So this was Mexico in 1970. And uh, you see now, unfortunately, it's not very clear. The children are sort of in a gray shading here. And this is now, as I said, our most recent results where we used uh, six uh, education categories, so more detailed information. And you see Mexico in 1970 was a pyramid that is even younger than a pyramid with straight lines on the side. It's a very young population. And it's a very poorly educated population. You see among the uh, women above age 30, again, more than half are dark red. They've never been to school. And then also a significant proportion has incomplete primary education just a few years. And almost no women had a lower or even upper secondary education. And of course, the fertility was very high, partly or mostly, I would assume, because of this very low education of women. Now time goes on. This is Mexico 1980. The population grows. You see here you have like only 52 million in 70. You have already almost 70 million in 1980. And slowly you see that the younger cohorts are getting better educated. You see some blue showing up here. 1990, the population continues to grow, 84 million. But now it's not only the secondary education, but you see the dark blue, the tertiary education also kicking in. First on the male side, but then also women. But at the same time, you still have a half of the elderly, of, sort of the main adult population with very, very low education. 2000, 2010. You now see that the, the fertility is falling and that the population is, is the young age groups are not increasing that rapidly anymore. And you also see that indeed uh, of the younger cohorts, almost everybody has seen a school from inside at least. And there's significant improvement in junior and secondary and senior secondary education and even tertiary education. But still the elderly, it takes decades for them uh, to, for this demographic metabolism to play its way. And the nice thing about this multidimension, you can reconstruct and simultaneously go into the future. We have now projections, but for projections you need scenarios because you Make, have to make different assumptions. So here we had a medium fertility and mortality scenario combined with different education scenarios. So here this is the global education trend scenario which is what we consider the most likely continuation of the past trend. And indeed uh, partly because of this what we call the inertia or the education momentum that the young are better educated as time goes on the adult population will be significantly better educated. So this is in 2040. Uh, it looks really optimistic, good. I mean, you will have among the young cohorts, if this trend continues, uh, more than 40%, uh, more than 50% with senior secondary education and increasing numbers. And I should say that I had the opportunity 10 days ago to be in Davos and listen to your president, uh, Peña Nieto, and he and actually had a discussion with him afterwards and I was really impressed in his presentation how strongly he focused, he discussed all the major problems that Mexico faces and then was pointing at the way forward and uh, he really very much has this sort of human capital perspective that also comes out of our analysis there at IASA that uh, investing in education does not pay off immediately, it's a longer term investment uh, but it is one of the safest investments you can make uh, for the future of a country.
Okay, we go on to 2050, and then in 2060, we stop these educational projections. It's 50 years into the future. It's, of course, a lot of assumptions. But then you see really a mature population of Mexico, a relatively stable age distribution, not like Singapore we had seen before. And you really see very well-educated young adults, which is most likely to also be translated into increasing economic productivity and also better health for the young as well as for the elderly. But this is a rather optimistic scenario. If we have the constant education rates scenario, which means that the school enrollment rates are not improved anymore. They stay constant at the current level. Well, then we get a very stagnant picture here. You still have the stabilization of the age distribution because fertility has already declined. Uh, but you still will have a core of the population, a significant proportion with very low education. And uh, so this is not an optimistic future. And this is the, the most po optimistic one could possibly think of. We call it the fast track scenario that we calculated for all countries in the world, uh, where uh, we sort of thought that if a country goes on on the policy for education like Singapore or South Korea had done, uh, very, very rapid expansion, the most rapid expansion that could take place. And then, indeed, they would be educated like Korea or Singapore are educated today, they were 50 years into the future. I should also say that uh, we've now had some discussions with Inehi uh, that we did this at the ASA for all countries in the world, and there's a thick book coming out with Oxford University Press that will document it, but we are now considering of doing similar scenarios of human capital uh, for all the states of Mexico. Okay, now let's go a bit uh, what uh, education does to population dynamics more generally. Uh, there was a review article in Science Magazine in 2011 summarizing some of these studies where we also showed uh, that education is not only good for the, the human capital and the economic side and the health side, but it is also a key to stabilizing world population growth. We, maybe later on we can discuss a bit, there is this paradigm of trying to meet the unmet need for family planning, but this only addresses uh, the gap between desired family size and actual family size. What female education does, it really significantly brings down the desired family size as well and makes it more likely for women then to uh, meet and fulfill uh, their desired family size. So uh, making certain assumptions that seemed plausible about uh, the, the future education-specific uh, fertility trends, we showed that different education scenarios, whether we go for the fast track or the constant enrollment rate scenario, already by the middle of the century, so less than 50 years into the future, caused the world population to differ by more than 1 billion. That's what you see here <coughs> in these charts. And of course, the fast track will not only have a much lower population size, but it also will have a much better educated population. So in that sense, female education in our analysis is clearly the key also to population stabilization. Now, many economists or social scientists wonder about what is this education effect? Is it really a causal effect? Or is it uh, just something that is sorting people that are different anyhow? And uh, we, in this new Oxford book, we therefore de dedicated a full chapter to addressing this causality issue. And we conclude that we have good reasons to assume what we call functional causality. From income, sorry, from education to health and to income and to fertility, so that education is not just a proxy for socioeconomic status. And we go back to really the physiology. Uh, there is a, a medical doctor, physiologist, Eric Kandel, who got the 2000 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his brain research. And we had interacted with him, and he's very explicit in saying that every learning experience changes our brains. We build new synapses, uh, new connections in our brains, and the structure will be different. And if we now repeat this topic, this issue for the third time, and you walk out through this door there, you are physiologically a different person than when you entered in. So education does really something with our body and with our brains. And therefore, it causes real changes. And it enhances, and this is more plausible, also the cognitive skills. There's evidence that more educated people 
have less risky behavior, we have a longer personal planning horizon, and more educated people can learn better from past damage. I mean, even if they start low on certain, they experience something new, but the learning curve is steeper. So this is things that you can use for the rest of your life for any kind of adaptation or reduction of vulnerability to any kind of risk. And on top of this, of course, being able to read and write gives you better access to relevant information. And uh, we'll soon talk about also the significant improvements on health and physical well-being that you find in every society, even if you try to standardize for possible privilege that people more educated will have in the health system and so on. There is a behavioral component where very clearly the education is linked to better health-related behavior, to more preventive uh, behavior. Okay, well, I don't have time and I need not show you all these educational differences that just a sample of DHS countries, Ethiopia, for instance, and in the countries that are just starting the fertility transition, these differences are the biggest. So you see in Ethiopia 2005, you have women who have no education, have more than six children on average, whereas if you have at least junior secondary education or higher, you already have two children only. A very significant in decline with education in virtually all countries in Africa. And equally pronounced is the decline with respect to infant mortality. Uh, their mother's education also is one of the key drivers and some scholars even uh, say that it's probably the single most important determinant of infant mortality decline. And you see even in countries like Nigeria where, I mean, there are some problems about the 2003 uh, DHS and everybody's waiting now for the most recent DHS for Nigeria to come out. Uh, but the, the situation seems to have worsened but it only worsened for the least educated women. The better educated have been stable and actually the educational gradient has become even stronger. Uh, we did another set of analysis and there was a paper studied, uh, published in Population and Development Review on this, like what is more important, income or education of the household? Because somehow economists always tend to think income by itself, naturally, is the most important uh, determinant. So what we did is we did a complex multivariate, multi-level analysis, but the picture appears very clearly already in this simple two times two table. It's like we took the sample and grouped them, the lower educated half and the higher educated graph and the poorer and the richer half. And then we look at the differentials there. As expected, of course, uh, the low educated and poor are doing the worst. They have an infant mortality rate of more than 50. And the more educated, richer, they are doing the best. They only have 18. So there's a big difference. But if you look at the off diagonal, that's interesting because there are some poor but relatively well educated. And they are doing significantly better than the rich with low education. In other words, education buys you more in terms of health of your children than income buys you. Okay, we can go through this discussion, and much has been written about it. Uh, the fact remains that at every stage of life, education matters. So these are now some disability surveys that we have in many countries of the world, and here I happen to show the Austrian data. Unfortunately, the labels are in German. So what you see is the, the proportion of women with severe disabilities in the so-called ADLs, the activities of daily life. Where you see, for instance, look at women aged 70 to 74. If the red line, this is only the basic education, which already in Austria is a junior secondary education, they have, at every of these higher ages, more than twice the prevalence of disability as compared uh, with women with higher education. And this, again, is pervasive with every health indicator you take. And, uh, and this cannot be explained by either being selective uh, or having an advantage in the health system. It seems to be indicative of a true causal effect of education, of the way you look after yourself. Of course, employment comes in. T typically, uh, the more educated have uh, less strenuous jobs. Also, for women, this is not so clear because women typically don't work in the construction sites. 
Uh, this may be just for fun. Uh, we also did an analysis of the members of academies of sciences in the world from the Royal Society. And here you see uh, the life expectancy at the age of 80, 60, the remaining life expectancy for members of the Austrian Academy. These are the blue, uh, sorry, this is the red line and then compared it with the blue dots uh, to the total population. The interesting thing is that up to the middle of the century, 1950, there is almost no difference. The members of the academy have no survival advantage after the age of 60 to the general public. But then after 1950, it spreads out, and you see these uh, uh, green triangles. They are the general population with tertiary education. They are, on average, three years higher life expectancy than the general population. But look at these academicians. They still are four years higher. They are taking off. And here, the most plausible hypothesis that we tested is it is indeed to continued activity, mental activity at high ages. You don't stop reading and speaking and writing. And so this is positive uh, sort of education and not stopping to use your brains and being academically active will make you healthier and live longer. Okay, we had several studies on uh, the demography, uh, consequences of educational attainment on economic growth, and as I said before, with these more differentiated measures of human capital by age and the full distribution, we could now finally resolve this long disputed economic topic um, where Economists, the theory suggested that, of course, human capital should be a key driver of economic growth, but the empirical evidence in these cross-country regressions was not there. Mostly, we could show because they used this rather bad indicator of mean years of schooling of the entire adult population, which mixed the highly educated young with the uneducated old in many of these uh, rapidly growing transition countries. Just very quickly going uh, through this, we had a paper in the Population and Development Review on Demography, Education and Democracy, where we also established a very strong relationship that if the general public is better educated, and interestingly, particularly if women are better educated, then the probability of moving into a more democratic regime, this is measured by the Freedom House Political Rights Index, is significant. Um, Another series of studies, many papers on the topic of education and the death from natural disasters. Uh, you see here, look, just a graphic on the right where we plotted many countries. But again, this is a descriptive. We have also sophisticated econometric analysis uh, where we show clearly that the higher the education, particularly of women, is the lower the death rate from a particular environmental hazard, in particular uh, flooding and hurricanes. And we had a comparative study, the three countries, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. They all here in the Caribbean region. It's the same storms pass over these countries. Typically, Cuba is very well prepared. They have a few damages, maybe a few injured people. Very rarely anybody dies in Cuba of hurricanes. Well, the Dominican Republic, which is much richer than Cuba, but less well-educated, you already see significant human losses. But of course, it's much most, more dramatic if you go to Haiti, which is both very poor and very uneducated. And there, the same hurricane causes thousands of deaths. So it's the same natural hazard, but a different preparedness of societies. Okay, this brings me now to the last topic, namely the interaction between population change, human capital, and climate change. And what I'm showing here is trying to close the full circle. Much of the analysis of population and environment has focused on the human energy consumption and the resulting greenhouse gas emissions. That's what you see here on the right-hand side under the heading consumption. The humans as the drivers as causing the problems. And we call this also in the climate change community the mitigation side, because if you want to mitigate climate change, meaning reducing the emissions, uh, we need to reduce consumption. But there's a second arrow there that shows that the solutions to this need to also come from us, from the human beings. And high hopes, and actually the only hopes at the moment, are really on technological innovation, or what we call green technologies, moving towards green growth and green economy that it seems to be not very realistic to expect people changing their behavior at any given uh, level of income. 
uh, but uh, if there are other technologies there to have the same level of well-being and consumption but less greenhouse gas emissions, then this is a realistic way of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. We can talk more about this in the discussion. But it's important to say that particularly also for this innovation side, it's also the human capital that matters. It's not just the number of being. Some of you may remember this controversy between Paul Ehrlich who said the world population explosion, there are too many people, and then Julian Simon, his country saying, well, all these new people, they mean all geniuses, they will bring the solutions. Well, it's not going to be the illiterate people that bring these uh, new technologies that cost the solution. It really requires uh, people that have the skills together with the innovative spirit uh, to do this. But what is also newer here now on this slide is what we try to focus on uh, more explicitly. It's the vulnerability of human populations. Very little has been done on this so far. There is likely to be some unavoidable climate change already. How will this affect human well-being in the future? Um, of course, for, to understand this, we need to project how societies are likely to look in the future, and these human capital and population projections that I showed you before give us some analytical handle to go for decades into the future. But the, I think the, the way for demographers to enter this is look at what I call differential vulnerability by age, by gender, by education, by place of residence, by household uh, size, and so on. So uh, geographers and all these people in the disaster community, they in the first instance look, where do the people live? I think we demographers also have to see who are the people. Not every person living in the same affected area is equally vulnerable. Typically, what we saw in the disaster, that the young and the elderly are more vulnerable than the middle-aged. Typically, women are more harmed and more vulnerable than men. And what comes out very strongly, the less educated are more vulnerable than the better educated. So this is a whole field of studies. And this has recently been translated uh, in the context of the global climate change uh, community, which is defining a new set of global scenarios. We call them the stress scenarios the shared socioeconomic pathways, where in the past, the previous set of global climate change scenarios, the stress scenarios, they were called, uh, they had uh, only population size. It was the only demographic variable about population size, total population size. Now these SSP, they have populations by age, sex, and level of education in the way that I showed it to you before. And uh, they are much more able uh, to uh, describe uh, the, uh, what is called here the socioeconomic challenges of future societies to both the mitigation side and the adaptation side. So this has been a collective effort of dozens of global climate modeling teams and uh, integrated assessment groups around the world. And they've also agreed that we need more in terms of social factors than just the population size, where population essentially is a, a standardizing variable. It's the denominator for GDP per capita and energy consumption per capita. But we need to get a richer picture of the future societal trends. And these sort of projections that I showed you before by age, sex, and education are an appropriate way of capturing at least the most important aspects. There are many more important, as many other important aspects that matter, but at least it's a good start. Okay, now I think my time is over, and uh, I just wanted to show, conclude with showing you some of these SSPs. Now, they're a little different from what I showed you before. Before, I showed you only, uh, if you assume identical education-specific fertility and mortality, and only have different education scenarios what comes out. Now here we also have in the high and low variance, uh, higher and lower education specific fertility trajectories. So the differences between the scenarios can become even bigger. So this is the world in 2010. You see it's a, a pyramid with, in red, you see what's sometimes called the bottom billion, the billion people who are still in poverty and without any formal education. Now the SSP one, that's the 
sustainable development, that is the most rapid development, also green development, sees the world population only growing to 8.5 billion. You see fertility below. It's a moderately aging population, but much more human capital, much better educated people at the global level. If we have the SSP3, this is the stagnated development pyramid. There you see a much bigger world population. It's going to be 10 billion already in 2050, one and a half billion more than the SSP1. It's a younger because the Africans in particular will have many more children and is a much worse educated. Uh, and we can see this also in world in charts. So this is the SSP2. This is the most likely trend as we consider the medium scenario. And actually, this is quite optimistic. And that, this simple graph makes me optimistic for the future, given all the positive consequences of education uh, that we have discussed, that the world population, in all likelihood, in the future, will be significantly better educated than today. And we can be so sure of this because of the demographic metabolism that I said. Many of these people are going to be alive in 2016, so they are already alive today, and we already know their education. We know that the young ones in almost every country are better educated than the old ones, and this will play out in the future. But of course, it could be better. This is the SSP1, and it could be uh, significantly worse. So this would be a world with stagnated population and education, sorry, stagnating fertility decline and not much more education. The world population could increase up to 12 billion with all the problems in terms of the environment and also a much more difficult time to adapt uh, to already unavoidable climate change. I think I've talked long enough and you have probably many questions, so I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. Now we have the comments of by our three discussants, and afterwards you could answer them. So let's start with Professor Francisco Alba. Uh, professor Alba is professor and researcher at the Colegio de México. He's an economist and demographer, and a an specialist on development implications of demographic change and on international migration. He's, he has published on Mexican migration and mi migratory policy, population and development, regional integration, Mexico-US relations, and related topics. Professor Alba is a former member of the Advisory Board of Mexico's Migration Institute of the United Nations Committee for the Protection, Protection of Migrant Rights and of the Global Commission on International Migration. He also is a former member of the Mexico-United States Binational Study on Migration of the Board of Trustees of the Population Reference Bureau and of the Committee on Population. National Research, National Research Council, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and um, he has trained as a demographer as a demographer at the Colegio de México, and also has done graduate graduate work in the social sciences at the Institute of Political Studies in Paris, and the University of Texas at Austin. So, Professor Alba. Eh, gracias, <coughs> y voy a pasar al inglés porque nos pidieron que hiciéramos los comentarios en inglés, lo haré obviamente con… bueno, haré lo mejor que pueda en inglés, desde luego. Well, well first of all, uh, I thank the invitation to participate in this, in this uh, probably the first uh, academic event of this uh, uh, year-long celebration of the 50 years of the, uh, let's say, of the studies on, on population and uh, also in economics in, in this institution. Um, I, my comments, I, I want to have a little bit like a sort of 50 years retrospective. Um, of course, it's going to be quite short, but uh, in what way a 50 years retrospective? It has to do with, of course, the anniversary of the center, but also because in the title of the presentation, there was this global human capital integrating education and population. And this uh, term integration, integrating, I mean, I couldn't help but remind me of that the, one of the main objectives and goal of the then project of the initiative of the, the Center for Economic 
uh, in demographic studies in 1964 was precisely the idea of trying to integrate economic variables, forces, dimension with the demographic and population ones. So that was a little bit the, the, a, a first reminder in the title. Uh, second, I would say that, um, uh, I mean, I enjoy the, the presentation and I always have enjoyed reading Lu Professor Lutz's um, work and of course the, the, the now the Wittgenstein Center uh, work on human capital. I think the term human capital is very much linked to Dr. Lutz in, in the Wittgenstein Center. Um, there are two main reasons why I really enjoy that, um, I mean, that, that, that work. And in my view, is because in general, this work is solidly grounded on theoretical, uh, on different theoretical uh, frameworks. I mean, in my view, is conceptually rich all the work, but also and of course, this has policy implications. You need really, in my view, to have analytical uh, linkages in order really to be, to be able to develop policy implications. And the second uh, reason for liking that is uh, that uh, this work, at the same time being conceptually strongly grounded, is also very much operational grounded. There is always a strong Pra there is, I mean, there is something like a practical tool to try to measure of what the theory says. Uh, of course, I'm going to exploit and, and say a few comments on the fair aspect, on the conceptually strong uh, elements in the in the presentation and in the in the in, the, in, the, in do Dr. Lutz's uh, work. Of course, I mean the presentation you you can see. I mean it touches on too many. I mean not too many, but and a lot, of, a lot of subjects, and it's quite difficult really to, to make comments on, I mean, at least comments that have certain uh, sense and value on, on, on uh, most of the topics. I want to uh, be looking basically on, 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 two, on, two, on two aspects. Uh, and uh, let me say uh, why I have this 40, 40, 50 years perspective, because in my view, Dr. Lutz's presentation and work, in my view, captures and embodies today many of the developments of the last 50 years along the lines in, in terms of our thinking on development issues and on population issues. And what I'm going to do is just to make a couple of reference uh, linkages or points of contact with other similar, different, but similar uh, conceptual uh, frameworks on development. In the 60s, I mean almost 50 years ago, when I was a student, a student in economics and also here in the, in the, in the, at the center, uh, the dominant uh, framework to study economic development was of course the term capital. And in those years, the idea was basically physical capital and financial capital. But already in those, day, in, in those years, there was already the concept of human capital as something quite elegant. That was a little bit starting to develop. Of course, the, from there, we move continuously, and now we have these concepts of human social development, economic development, and of course, sustainable development. But I think since 50 years ago, there were plenty of the, 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 the concept already of human development was already there. Uh, this, uh, in my view, is also, uh, I mean, it's quite important to have this idea of how the concepts ev evolve through time. And Dr. Lutz's, without having, of course, this history of development, but his work captures and embodies all those developments. Um, Another, in the 60s also, in the 60s, there were already some challenges to this, uh, what you, I might call, unregulated or unchecked industrialization or industrialism. That was, if you, if you remember, in the early 70s, the, the, I mean, that was a little bit a sound of alarm in the, in the book, The Limits to Grow, by the Club of Rome. 
So that was, you know, so the, 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 the war, I mean, the years have passed and there has been a lot of, we say in Mexico, el, 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 el assay, the assay, ha llovido mucho. It has been, it has rained a lot since those, those years. Um, and another uh, element, uh, I'm saying this in part because I, I know there are ele students here and I've been a professor on some of these uh, uh, areas and I hope that uh, they can link some of what probably they read or carry in, in, in the classroom. That uh, there is, in the, in the 80s, there was also a very interesting development, uh, the theoretical framework, what is called endogenous growth. Endogenous growth has to do with the idea that the important role of education and knowledge in promoting economic development. That was really quite important in part because it helped to explain something that was until then a sort of a puzzle. In the sense that according to conventional economic theory, many people expected that at some point that would be a, a trend toward economic convergence among different nations and countries. In part due to the fact, the idea of the most factor of production enter into stages of diminishing returns. But it turns out that education acknowledged in many ways there are no diminishing returns on that. And so the idea of endogenous growth came to explain a little bit in the sense why the countries continue to defer in terms of income and advancement and so on and so forth, in part due because there was not only physical capital that mattered, but human capital, and human capital continued to produce new knowledge, innovation, and that way those who were advanced continued to be advanced, and it was more difficult for others to catch up. That has to do, of course, with this idea, of course, I mean, in, in, in that it was quite relevant because somehow this has to do with the context of an increasing world economy, all these ideas, what we know about globalization and so on and so forth. Nowadays, it's quite common to say the, 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 the acknowledged economy and so on and so forth. So there are all those linkages here present. Now, a couple of ideas or developments on the population field. In 1971, I mean, you allow me to, you know, to make remembrances. Uh, in 1971, there was here in Mexico City, uh, the, I think was the first in Spanish Conferencia Regional Latinoamericana de Población, I mean the regional conference uh, of Latin American population. And uh, in that year, among the attendants was Professor Nathan Kifitz. He was relatively young and he was already looking for researchers that could somehow join him in doing this applied mathematics to demography. And that is one of the foundations of some of the methodology that you find in, in, in this approach. So he was already there. Uh, of course, I didn't take advantage of that opportunity, but uh, that's a pity for me, probably. But anyhow, that was already, those developments were present. Uh, the other point that I would like really to, to, to I mean, another, this, another point of contact is that in the 80s, in my view, there was something quite important to show the complexity and heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity of population effects. And I am alluding to the work of McNichol that came to system, systematize and to put some order on these effects, and he called them size effects of population, age structure effects, composition effects, and of course, the tempo effects, tempo in terms of the rate of change of this. Well, I found some, again, there are points of contact, I don't want to go saying the similarities, but this concept of demographic metabolism, to me, has to do in many ways with a combination of age and composition education in this case effects. So, I mean, uh, that's why I like the, really so much the, 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 your work. And another point of contact, of course, has to do with the, the implications 
Uh, that was, this is a development, more recent one, what is called the new economic demography. That was late uh, 1990s, and basically it's, it's a development of this century. It has to do with this, uh, uh, again, with new economic demo demography that puts, puts a lot of emphasis on the concept that you are all familiar with, demographic dividends, demographic bonus, etc., etc. But of course, the point here is that these dividends are not automatic, are not deterministic. You need, of course, to combine with other developments, like education, educating population. It has to do a little bit with all what we're, we're seeing here. And this new economic demography also talks about the, the youth bulge, I mean, the, 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 la, el, la expansión, el, el engrosamiento, si se quiere, de la, sorry, for, de la, de la juventud. Uh, and, and this is quite interesting because this, some of these ideas has to do with this also contact with political science ideas. I mean, this is democracy, you were listening about this, and people linked to that with some of the events in the, the, the recent, you know, Arab Spring and, and, and so on and so forth. And it has to do also with, it's not only the youth world, it's to put in contact with other generations. So there are generational gaps that, that can, can, can enter into conflict with them. So I think all, I mean, all this makes uh, really, to me, exciting, the, the, it's, it's rich, really, the, 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 the work, because it's a combination of sound, analytical, theoretical, conceptual frameworks, and also strong methodolog methodological tools and instruments. I think the combination of these two elements, of course, makes for a very uh, increases the heuristic capacity of the ideas. Now, let me say a couple of things uh, in relation with all that. I think the presentation, uh, uh, and in many ways, some, I mean, the work, stresses the importance of two classical components in, in population studies, and related, of course, with the, uh, the, the, the integration with other factors and disciplines the area of the importance of determinants of population behavior, and as well of the importance of implications of population behavior. The two of them are important. There is no point in saying which of these is more important. I think in the presentation you have the two components present. I would, uh, I mean, if I allow, I would say that there is a little bit um, caveat on a little bit of presentation, and I mean, again, if I may allow to say it, it has to do with some of the same caveats that has to do with most theories. There is nothing automatic on deterministic on that. There is nothing deterministic on, you know, the demographic dividends is just a possibility. It's a situation that carries potential, but it's a combination with other elements that somehow materialize what is possible. So, I mean, this is just a caveat, not in the sense, I'm not in any way saying that uh, there is a determinism in here, but you have to be careful that all these structures and, and graphs, of course, in order to carry and really contribute to development, have to be combined with other, you know, developments in economics and politics and so on and so forth. And finally, if I have a minute, uh, I might say a couple of things regarding Mexico. Uh, well, I think you all know that uh, in, this is central to the topic, one of the topics of the presentation, education. We in Mexico are, I mean, it's one of the, for the last year, and well, it has been for years, we are now, last year we have a so-called education reform, you know, to try to do something on this field. Um, uh, here is, there is a tool available to try to measure if there is some advancement. I mean, uh, it's not that, uh, but I think it's important to be able to measure in other, other, otherwise we don't know if there is progress or not. And this is, this is one of the potential of, this, of, this, of, the, of what we see. Uh, in relation to, to education, I might uh, just recall that uh, in 2008, there was an article that uh, I like very much, 
and that was by David Mayer Phelps. And the title of that was The Human Development Trap in Mexico. And by human development trap, he meant that this country hadn't been able to really to pass, to cross a certain threshold on health front and educational front. And that, and, and, and that's vegan, I was going to say. <laughs> and, and, and that's why, in many, in many ways, the country has not been able really to change qualitatively in, in this area. Uh, the second thing that I want to say, and has to do with some of the, you know, it's part of the whole, let's say, approach, if you may say, the, the usefulness of scenarios, of creating different scenarios to explore, is explore uh, uh, implications, uh, to explore things. There is nothing deterministic on that, it's just exploration. And I'm saying this because quite recently, I could say that in Mexico we could uh, talk about a demographic scenario pre-2010 census and a demographic scenario post-2010 census. Because, the, I mean, the, the implications of, of what was found in the 2010 census, and of course other dependence has to do with not so much immigration to the U.S. and so on and so forth, comes you with two sets of, of, of uh, uh, population uh, scenarios, expectation, quite different, that had plenty of implications, size effects, uh, 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 age structure effects, composition effects, and tempo effects. Uh, just to mention just one, is that by 2010, excuse me, by 2030, let's say in less than 20 years' time, according to the new scenario, the newest scenario, the population in Mexico would be higher by more than 16 million than the previous one. 16 million people is not something that you can dismiss like that. It's more than 10% of the population that was previously estimated. So to me, it has been really a real pressure to be able to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Now let's continue with the comments of by Professor Silvia Kierjuli. Let me present her. Uh, Silvia Kierjuli is currently full-time professor at the Center of Demogra for Demographic, Urban, and Environmental Studies at the Colegio de México. Since 2009, she was appointed, appointed as director of the center. She's also fo founder and current director of the journal Coyuntura Demográfica, Open Access Journal of the Mexican Demographic Society. She got his, her master's degree in demography at the Colegio de México, and she graduated from the PhD program in sociology from Brown University. Between 2007 and 2008, she was appointed as, as fellow at the Center of the Advanced Studies in Behavior, Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford University. She recently participated in the scientific panel of the National Academy of Science, US, on migration estimates. She is part of the research group and coordinator of the education team in the binational study on the welfare of Mexican migrants in Mexico and in US, organized by the Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social, CSIS, and Georgetown University. She is current, currently member of the National System of Researchers and several professional associations. Uh, she was vice president and president of the Mexican Society of Demography. Her research has con concentrated on international migration between Mexico and US, specifically on the impact of human mobility and social processes, such as family formation, education, and labor trajectories. She has also conducted research on transition to adulthood in Latin America and on consequences of, of demographic change on education. Her, pu her publications in journals, book, and book chapters concentrate in these areas of research. So, Bueno, este, buenas tardes otra vez. Voy a cambiar a inglés. ¿Me avisas del tiempo? Sí, okay. 
So uh, it's not easy. I would say that it's even challenging to comment on Wolfgang's work. You have seen how vast and extensive it is. I, I have discovered that we have a bias towards population and education because Marta and I are more education experts than, uh, than on the other topics. And I hope that uh, this omission on environmental issues may be, full, may be filled by the professors and those topics that are here with us today in the questions and Q&A part. Um, so when I was trying to organize my comments on, on Professor Lutz's work, I decided to focus on what I know best, and, it's, and that is population dynamics and, and education. Um, I, I was, first I tried to, I, I said, well, I, I should try to make some questions. At the end, I think that I got some unfinished ideas that are not really questions, but that may be questions in the future. And uh, among, it's a, as, as you see, it's a very fruitful and a very wide um, range of topics that were, um, that are presented in, in Professor Lutz's work. So I decided, or oh, I concentrated only on three ideas. So the first one has to do with population dynamics, and, uh, and I will focus a little bit on the Mexican experience. Even though the talk, the talk was on global human capital, I will talk a little bit about how the human, the Mexican experience does relate, or how does it fit with some of the, the work you, you, you have mentioned in your presentation. So first I will talk about population dynamics and education. So what Professor Lutz's work is doing is bringing back macro approaches. If you look at the research on population dynamics and education in the last 20 years in Mexico, it has basically focused around micro studies. So now we know more about the effect of fertility on education, the effect of family size and shift size on education, family structure, and on gender inequalities. And we have gained a lot from those, from those uh, micro approaches. We know now that less children are related to better educational outcomes, that parental coresidence is also linked to better educational outcomes, and uh, we have targeted as one of the main issues, the main points of the educational policies, diminishing the gender inequalities in educational attainment. I have to say that most of this research has been done basically analyzing enrollment and attainment, and less has been done in terms of achievement or, or uh, quality in terms of, or, and content in terms of representation. So Professor Lutz's work brings us back at looking at age and sex composition with educational attainment. And the first lesson is that age structure matters for looking more precisely at changes in education, even within cohorts. And, for, and the second, is, I think it's a very powerful message in terms of planning and setting goals and, uh, for future um, education uh, scenarios. He, he showed us future plausible scenarios based on protection, projections towards gains in education. And I think this should be an, uh, an important input in planning and educational policies, that it should also inform, for example, the attention to certain sub subgroups, cohorts, gender differences. Uh, that it should be an important input in terms of planning the demand given different scenarios. But I think that there's also a very interesting lesson on what we see when we do look comparatively at the different countries. And it's that the rate of change in education, even though we know that, we, that, the, that it's not possible to see the results of um, an increase in educational attainment in the, long, in the short term, we do see that there are changes or there are very large differences in countries such as Singapore, Vietnam, South Korea, that made very fast the transition in terms of the attainment um, uh, uh, and gains in education within, uh, among cohorts. So um, and here I would like to refer to sort of a paradox on the link between population dynamics and education in the Mexican case. Um, in a tra now <coughs> traditional work by Cole and Hoover, we learned that size and the growth of school age population mattered in terms of the pressure that it exerted on social investment, especially on education, and in terms of saying, well, if you have a larger population and that is growing more rapidly, it's more difficult to respond to that demand. And uh, um, all this, uh, again, all this literature was basically focused on increasing attainment. So what happened in Mexico? When you look at Mexico, the high growth of school age population that came from prior periods of higher fertility coincide with the largest growth in enrollment in, in, in all decades. 
So, uh, in, a less planned and pl in a less planned and planned way, Mexican society was able to accommodate the growing demand for spaces in schools. Basic education expanded and it became almost universal. There was an important decrease in gender inequalities in terms of access. And uh, there has been an expansion from basic to middle and tertiary education. But this expansion in terms of uh, middle and tertiary education has not been as successful. It has occurred at a slower pace. And uh, we haven't solved the problem of access to middle school and tertiary education, and there's a large dropout. So um, when you look at higher, at higher attainment, you not, not necessarily look at these problems of access and uh, in terms of dropouts especially. Um, the second idea has to do with uh, educational attainment and other educational outcomes. As I said, in the Mexican case, the expansion, the massive expansion of the educational services came at the cost of the quality of education. So, for example, in the 90s and in the first decade of this century, the expansion of secondary education was related a lot to distance learning. So, in some of the poorest states in Mexico, 40% of the students in what we call secundaria are attending telesecundarias. That means distance learning. So, we have these large differences in terms of quality of education, and this, has, this seems to be not one of the goals in educational policy. Um, so I think that we need more instruments to measure how we are lagging behind in achievement at the international level. Uh, if we think of how, if we move from attainment to achievement or what looking at the age structure by attainment may teach us about, or may inform us about attainment, and we think about the implications, um, as, as Wolfgang Lutz had mentioned, his work emphasized the gains on education, for example, in terms of women and empowerment, women and how fertility decreases and other papers that he didn't present today but he also has talked for example of productivity based on age and dependent productivity es estimates that are also related to educational composition so in mexico um, it, when you have this a scenario of gains in attainment fertility is already low and, and th there's still a lot to be done in terms of the unequal access to reproductive health, but let's say that we are sort of on the, on the way. But we do find these differences in terms of achievement. You talk in your presentation about functional causality. So it would, for example, one of the questions is whether the impact of secondary education would be the same depending on the quality of education. If the impact of secondary education on disabilities, for example, would be the same given these differences in terms of the content and the quality of education. If the productivity estimates would be the same if you consider the quality of education. And I also think that the, the, the way that the, the reason why uh, the gains in middle and tertiary education have not been as successful as it was with the expansion of basic education has to do with these differences in quality. Now, when you have all these problems in quality at the basic levels and you drag them towards higher educational attainment, it sort of diminishes the possibility of keeping on growing. Um, the third and final idea has to do with gender, population dynamics, and education. When you read some of the papers by uh, Professor Lutz, there's a large focus at, 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 at in the international deba debate on girls. No, girls. And this emphasized on decreasing inequalities, gender inequalities, and, uh, in, and all what we gain from focusing on girls' education. But I think that, um, and, and, it's, and I think it's, I, I, I don't want to say that it's not important, I think that it's still relevant to keep on that track. track. But I do think that we have some evidence from the educational fields and even from the recent results from the census in Mexico, that um, we should also be thinking a little bit about boys. Dropouts and enrollment is lower for uh, boys than for women in Mexico and in other Latin American uh, countries at the tertiary level. We have found in Mexico, for example, that mortality for violent causes has increased for the population between 15 and 29 for boys. So in this link that you mentioned continuously between health and education, we, will probably be, we should probably think about this link between health and education for men in Mexico. And we also know, or we have some ideas that boys and girls may be dropping out for different reasons. So that would lead us to different population policies if you want, educational policies if you want to improve the attainment. Um, 
I, I even had the question, but I don't know if whether the recent mortality patterns of young men in Mexico may affect the estimates that you have put up. That I don't know. So to finish, uh, as I mentioned before, I selected to focus on education among the variety of, of topics. We could talk about demographic dividends, Francisco already did a little bit, about migration and its selectivity. For Mexico, migration is a large issue. When you have 17% of your working age population living in the US, that may probably have an effect on the composition by educational attainment. Climate change, but I hope that Bori, Sergio, and the urban and environmental studies students may help us there. But, but what is very interesting of this methodology is that it can be used also to other approaches. And as is mentioned in one of the papers, for example, if we were interested in ethnic composition, in the use of ethnic languages, etc. cetera. Um, I think that uh, Professor Lutz is also very valuable in terms of bringing in what demography can contribute to understanding change in this specific case on the dynamics on education and the policies on education. Uh, I, I would invite especially our students to look at the methodology. And again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Lutz for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvia. Finally, we have the comments by Professor Marta Mieteran, who is researcher in the Institute of, for Social Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and is a member of the National System of Researchers. She received his her PhD in demography at the University of Montreal in Canada. She has several books and papers published in national and foreign journals. She has taught courses and thesis aimed at UNAM and other institutions of higher education. Her research interests focus on issues related to fertility transitions to adult life, educational level, labor, and family formation among young people and quantitative methods in population studies. So, Marta. First of all, I want to thank El Colegio de México, El CEDUA, and Victor Garcia for the opportunity to be here and comment the presentation of Professor Wolfgang Lutz. It is a pleasure to read and listen to the creative, innovative, and rigorous work of Dr. Lutz. Dr. Lutz's work is distinguished by extensive research projects. Extensive in terms of contents, his proposal is characterized by the development of technical and methodological instruments, the link between disciplines and fields of study, as well as the search for theory. Geographically, his project deals with the situation of the world as a whole, as well as that of regions and specific countries. In terms of time, the long-term trend analysis prevails in his work in order to have an impact in current social and economic policies. In his article, Global Human Capital Integrating Education and Population, he develops an extremely fruitful integration of two fields of study, education and population dynamics. Some of the relations between education and demographic processes, mainly fertility, have been frequently analyzed. However, Dr. Lutz has succeeded in integrating these relations into dynamic multi-state models of population projection, letting variables act together and resulting in different key scenarios. Educational attainment is the single most important source of heterogeneity in a population because of, as he mentioned, the, it reflects the learning of individuals, but also it reflects uh, in very heterogeneous societies. It also reflects the socioeconomic background of the people. Patterns of fertility, health, and mortality, as well as those of migration, differ by level of education. From a methodological point of view, data on education is relatively easy to collect in censuses and surveys, and it is possible to measure across countries. 
thus conforming population groups by educational attainment and projecting them with different age and sex patterns of mortality, fertility, and migration reveals interesting long-term results because education substantially reflects its dynamic. In the interpretation of results, I found it very interesting the consideration of having the individual as well as the community level effects of increasing education and population dynamics because better educated women generate contexts more favorable for lower fertility patterns and reduce population growth. The results in 2050 of the four different education scenarios show that for the population growth, having the very optimistic scenario does not greatly differ from the global education trend scenario that assumes that countries will follow the average path expansion of other countries further advanced. The great difference around 1 billion inhabitants is with the constant enrollment rate scenario. Of course, the population level of education greatly varies depending on the scenario, but it is clear the relevance of keeping efforts to improve education levels in order to have a better world. One aspect that I would have liked to see developed in the interpretation of the results is the relationship between education, fertility timing, and population growth. Education favors smaller family sizes, but also the postponement of childbearing. With increasing ages at birth of fair child, population growth tends to be slower, so that this would be one of the reasons why a more educated population would have smaller increases. The effect is not enormous, but there is a, a, an effect from the timing of fertility. It seemed to me most pertinent to review the other way around of the relationship between education and population growth. But the speed of population growth also affects schooling opportunities, as was said by, by Sylvia. High population growth results in increasing school age population, and if new schools are not created, enrollment rates will go down. It is mentioned in the paper that because of political and economic problems, some African countries in the 80s were not able to cope with the population growth and enrollment rates diminished. Furthermore, it is stated that the stall in fertility decline in some African countries around the year 2000 is in part the result of the stall in education of young female cohorts in the 80s. I found that most interesting. You will see why. Thinking of the situation in Mexico, data on schooling by age and sex is available, as you already know, in the last six population censuses since 1960. The 60s were the years where the fastest population growth took place, with annual rates close to 4%. At the same time, enrollment in primary school grew annually at a rate of 11%. And the enrollment rates are almost doubled, increasing from 34% to 66%. Government efforts to increase the very low levels of education in these years of rapid population growth were enormous. The increasing educated female cohorts started their childbearing years in the 80s and 90s, when fertility decline was fastest. The role of family planning programs in the fertility decline of these years has been emphasized. But certainly, more educated women were able to better make use of the family planning programs. On the other hand, in the 80s in Mexico, uh, we had some years of economic stagnation. However, population growth was not as fast 
and increases in primary school enrollment were achieved, the rate augmented from 79% to 90% during this decade. Nevertheless, the decline of fertility did stall around the year 2000, as in the African countries. And the possible effect of the slower growth in school enrollment should be investigated. This is something we have not uh, reflected enough about, but it should be investigated. I just want to finish my short comment saying that uh, Dr. Lutz and Yasa work is stimulating, inspiring, and orienting on one side public policies, but also researchers in the different fields, uh, just to mention demographers and education specialists. Thank you very much. Gracias, Marta. Um, now, uh, before to open the floor to the rest of the public, of the public, uh, I don't know if you want to answer some of the questions or to have another talk. Well, maybe just very quickly because with the time has already progressed quite a bit. And well, thank you much, so much for these very rich sets of comments, and thank you also so much for your friendly words and words of appreciation. Um, Francesco, I really liked your longer term perspective and it's quite appropriate in this 50th anniversary and sort of uh, drawing the main ideas uh, of uh, uh, the interaction between uh, development economics on the one hand and demography on the other hand. And I agree with, with all the points that you said and I just wanted to pick, because it's a very important point uh, that you made at the very end, that there is nothing automatic about any social policy, including uh, the education policy. And I, I fully agree with this. And uh, the way I put it sometimes is uh, that at least the studies so far show that indeed uh, education and human capital formation is a necessary precondition, uh, but it cannot be a fully sufficient uh, condition. I mean, there's nothing that is a sufficient condition. We all know that there is no magic, no silver bullet. And, uh, but education, I think, uh, scores very well among the different possible policies because of its multi-purpose empowerment. And in many of these big uh, uh, systems analytical models that I've calculated for different parts of the world, it's always been, I think, like which of the few adjustment screws that are open to policy interventions are the most effective for the long-term benefit of societies, and education always comes out as one of these, but still it's not the silver bullet. Uh, well, thank you, Silvia. You made uh, very important comments in respect to the interactions between uh, the educational advance and uh, the fertility decline, and it's, it's very clear, and it has been picked up by Martha as well, uh, that, of course, in the case of an expanding uh, youth population, it's even more difficult to increase enrollment. Some people have used this picture of an uphill battle. You are sort of fighting against the tide. And the more remarkable it is that not only in Mexico, but also some of the Asian tiger countries and so, actually, uh, it's, they managed to do it despite of this uh, difficulty. And so from a policy perspective, the question is really like many of these uh, studies around the demographic dividend paradigm, they say, well, first we should try to bring down fertility. They don't say exactly how, but somehow through family planning programs. And then in a second phase, of course, it needs to be utilized, this dividend materialized through investments in education. Actually, we just have now in this uh, January issue of demography a paper where we uh, put this a bit upside down and show that indeed the demographic dividend is an education dividend. So if the investment first comes in education, then it in parallel helps to bring down the fertility as well as has an independent effect on productivity. That's a more technical manner, but it, it just shows that these two things are integrated. In no way I want to play uh, at investments in female education against the family planning and reproductive health. I mean, they both need to be there, and I think in a very good way, they synergistically support each other. Now, uh, the question that you posed quite rightly is uh, sort of the, uh, the achievement in addition 
to the attainment and uh, the sort of how this is particularly important at the, for the secondary level and also Martha hinted in this uh, direction. Well, uh, the, there are some studies. Of course, achievement data are only for a limited set of countries, mostly the OECD countries. And there are some economic studies that do show and that indeed uh, some of the economic growth differences between OECD member countries can be explained by differences in the quality of education in addition uh, to the, the quantity of education. On the other hand, there has been a study by the UNESCO Institute of Statistics in Montreal that shows that given all these issues, but still formal educational attainment is the single best predictor of the skills of a person. So, Yes, the quality dimension adds something and it becomes, I think, the more important, the higher you go up in the specialization where content also matters. Uh, but we really need to do more work and need to try to find quality data also for more countries because so far it's really been mostly the industrialized countries. Uh, yeah, and the last point maybe I fully agree with the thing that Martha has highlighted is the, the importance of community level effects. Like what in all these decompositions projections, we essentially are aggregating up individual level effects. And as I mentioned in this uh, review paper that you cited, uh, I'm aware of this and actually uh, these, many of these effects of education on fertility and on health and so are probably even stronger uh, being reinforced to this community level effect. If there's a critical mass of educated women in even an African village, I mean women with basic education, that tends to improve the health services for all women in the village and not only for the educated women. So that makes this even a, an optimistic note to end. Thank you. Thank you again, <laughs> Professor. Now I'm going to open the floor, the floor for questions from the rest of the public. The public. So, yes. So, ent entonces, eh, de nuevo les pedimos que hagan sus preguntas en inglés y, este, y breves, por favor. Entonces, Estela, Adriana y Brígida, Boris. No, este. Uh, well, uh, I want to thank you, uh, as everyone else has, uh, for your presentation. And I think my question has to do with what, uh, in some uh, manner, everyone else has pointed about uh, the interaction between phenomena and, uh, well, I, and whether uh, predicting is calling is, in some sense, well, I put this, uh, this is my summary in, in, in a way uh, of what can be a common point in everyone's comments. Uh, and before saying that, I, I have to say that I like very much your systemic way of, or, or your systemic approach to try to predict uh, all the demographic phenomena together and to try to, uh, and to bring education or schooling into that uh, Predic uh, prospects or predictions. But uh, my question is, when we are trying to predict population and a demographic phenomena in terms of public policy, is schooling really the best entry point for those predictions? Uh, in terms of, okay, we are going through the systemic approach and we are predicting migration and fertility and mortality and population size at the same time. And then we are bringing a schooling, right? That's, in a sense, what you're doing. Uh, but when, if, and then we are trying to, and we are doing this in a way because we are trying to do or give some policy recommendations. Uh, but this brings me to a, more, a deeper point, which is, well, is really schooling the fastest intervention in terms of giving results uh, and or the and I'm not really sure because uh, if, if we think schooling is really a generation or a cohort uh, entry point and probably fertility is something that happens 
well, it's sooner, or migration is something that happens where it can have effects sooner, or mortality is something that can happen sooner. And is this something that do we have an answer for or not? And, uh, and probably with all the data that you have already gathered uh, in different countries, uh, we can have a result for that. Or, and that's, thank you. Um, regarding the projections, I have two questions. First, um, regarding the schedule of fertility and nuptiality, since uh, timing of events such as, such as nuptiality and fertility matters in educational enrollment and attainment, have you, when you talk about fertility, were you including the level of fertility or the mean age at first birth? And do you consider important to incorporate in the analysis uh, the mean age at first uh, union? And my second question is um, the limits of the change of educational structure. Considering that the relationship between educational and productive structure is a two-way relation, I was uh, wondering if the changes presented in the, in the projections might be affected if there is no response at all or if there is no response in the same measure of the change of productive structure. Productive structure, you mean labor force uh, participation? Or? For instance, I was wondering, in, in the case of um, a world in 2100, oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. where everyone, or at least 80% of population, has secondary or tertiary education, what will happen with the f agriculture sector, you know, yeah, sure. or the f primary activities? Yeah. Um, okay, um, I would like to uh, touch to two apparently very simple uh, statements you made in your presentation. One is related to demographic uh, metabolism, and you say, uh, you explain societal change either uh, in, the, in terms of endogenous variables, composition of, of the population, or two, external changes affecting population. And then you mention that geographers have the question where, and demographers have the question who. So I want to uh, argue in favor of uh, the question where. Uh, for obvious reasons, for the disciplinary and epistemological reasons, uh, geographers ask about the context and about the scale. So they have to deal with space and they have to deal with where. And, and uh, even, even uh, population geographers would be uh, worried about where. So uh, maybe uh, these external processes affect or influence decision, individual decisions. So uh, maybe that would probably uh, provide a different answers, a different answer than the uh, demographic uh, approach to uh, demographic metabolism, I think. And, and the second question is, uh, is uh, probably, uh, I, I wonder if it's endogenous. But uh, I, I, I was wondering, uh, what, what do you think about what is happening in, in Britain, for example? The young population are rejecting, are not induced to keep in school. They, they are rejecting further uh, education. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if culture is an endogenous or not. It's a, I have difficulties in, in, in accepting uh, culture in accepting culture as, as, as endogenous, uh, unless uh, we talk about uh, countries. If we talk about within countries, we, we think about space in a different uh, way and uh, about scale, then perhaps uh, 
I wonder if geographers will, will have an answer, and I, and I, I, I am probably sure that the demographers can explain why young people in Britain, in some areas in Britain, are rejecting a school. Professor Lutz, uh, you have made a very strong case and very convincing case about this idea of uh, functional causality, no, of education that Sylvia referred to in many different fields, like fertility, uh, going health, climate change, and income. And in this context, uh, I would like to share with you uh, the concern that we have in Mexico about the weakening of the relationship between education and income. And I would like to know uh, how do you see this coming from Austria? <laughs> uh, do you see this happening in other countries? Do you think that this is the result of the economic crisis? Or uh, do you still feel that you can make a strong statement about the relationship between higher education and higher income? So I think. OK, uh, thank you very much. Many very interesting uh, questions. So I just go in the order I took note. Uh, the first uh, intervention, I think you had two points. Uh, the one is sort of the adding the, the education dimension to the uh, population projections by age and sex, what it does. And uh, I think it just makes uh, an additional source of heterogeneity explicit. I may even compare it to, uh, you know, in the, in the past, up to the middle of the 20th century, all population projections were essentially uh, exponential growth models of total population size. And then the cohort component model added the age structure. Because they found out that countries have very irregular age structure, if they have stable age structures, then there's no value added. But if they have irregular age structures, uh, then, uh, it, of course, the outcomes are different. And now we have the evidence that there's another source of heterogeneity, nam namely quite different uh, education structures that have equally an importance for the future. So we're just making another source of heterogeneity, explicit sort of endogenizing it into the model. Um, the other question was how fast can it make a change? Um, yeah, in some respects, the economic and the health consequences for yourself, they can have longer term consequences, they take decades, but still worthwhile. I mean, if in 1960, uh, Singapore and South Korea were poorer than Kenya and Uganda were then. But they have discussed, decided to massively invest, and then since the 1980s had this massive economic growth. And yes, of course, for 50 years it was worth the investment, although it took a while. Um, there are, however, some consequences where you can also see immediate benefits. They have to do with uh, teenage pregnancies and fertilities in Africa. It's really if the girls are kept in school and if they are well-functioning schools where they are not raped by, by men or where there are sanitary fertilities that are appropriate, of course, this uh, keeps girls from being married away as a child already. And, and also uh, get more access, more information. So there you have within the next five years immediate positive consequences on avoiding teenage pregnancies. A similar thing with infant mortality. Even, and this was a question, there's some interesting evidence that even if a woman in an African village attends school only irregularly for less than a year, she learns there's something. She learns something that it's worth thinking about things <coughs> or the question or usually that Adults talk directly to a child and answer sort of a more rational, more uh, discourse kind of things. And the, the evidence shows that even for this very low, very low quality school attendance, infant mortality positively reacts in terms of declines. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, the question on the schedule of fertility and nuptiality and the mean age of first birth. Uh, we do not explicitly consider nuptiality for, for various reasons, because in an increasing number of countries, uh, it is relatively irrelevant. 
uh, in Sweden as many babies were born out of wedlock as uh, in couples. And of course, implicitly, the, uh, the changing age profile uh, of fertility also captures uh, the, uh, the changing uh, marriage patterns. So what we do is we, we model uh, the age-specific uh, fertility schedules and have different such models, different timing also with respect to the educational groups reflected in almost every country, the more educated are having their children somewhat later, in addition to having them lower. And this is also a point that was raised before, like this, this tempo distortion effect uh, that uh, needs to, of course, to be taken into account that uh, we see in many countries a postponement of childbearing, um, and that is even stronger for more educated women, so that the period fertility rates are temporarily depressed as long as, depressed as, long as the postponement goes on. Uh, yeah, the production structure was the second point. Of course, I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen in more than 50 years. Essentially, we are. We feel only confident to the year 2060. That's where we sort of officially stop our education projections. But then, because of these climate change scenarios, they do uh, some simulations up to the end of the century. We just keep parameters rather constant and just have extensions of how the momentum of some of the things uh, plays out. But of course, uh, the question is like, what will be the jobs? We have societies uh, today in, in the Nordic countries. Or, in many European countries, we are a very tiny fraction, less than 5% of the population produce the food for the entire country. It's a very, uh, because uh, even agriculture is very automatized and, and increasingly even car mechanics need to be uh, computer engineers to program all the chips that are in the car. And, and sort of every job essentially is moving in the direction of requiring more qualifications, higher skills. So. Um, I think that's the way it goes, and uh, I've recently talked to an American economist who uh, was sort of wondering why Europe is so concerned about the low fertility rate. He said, I think that will save you mass, mass unemployment because we have this continuing automation and we need fewer people in the future and these fewer people need to be more skilled. If we have more people, it will be just adding to the number of unemployed in Europe. So that's an open question where we really don't know how it goes. The question of uh, where and who, of course, I tried to sort of overdo it a bit in a pointed way. The problem I sometimes have that from a geographic perspective, it's only where you are. Of course, I don't think anybody claims it matters only who you are, irrespective of the context. Of course, the context does matter. Um, and it's interesting really to study how it changes the relative importance. I, I personally have the view, and this is shared by some others, that in the age of internet, it becomes less important where you are. Like this morning, I was continuing to supervise my students in Vienna that I had done yesterday. Also, I was on the other side of the Atlantic. It didn't matter. I was sitting on the internet whether I would have done this from Vienna or not. But what matters are the established personal relationships. But of course, in most cases, the establishment in particular happens in, in spatial vicinity. And the families can only be together and you, you need to start talking to the people. And that's why it's very different for me to sit here and have a discussion with you than just being remotely via Skype here and they have no interaction. So space continues to matter uh, greatly, I have no doubt. Uh, but it's interesting to, to observe uh, in what respects, in this case, the, the who you are is more important than where you are and in which the where is more important. In Britain, I don't really know what's going on there. I mean, there are indeed cultural differences. I mean, particularly in Asia, it is education system sometimes very, very tough. And that is also has to do with the, the, the second step. You said you have an expansion first of the school enrollment, but then when it comes to improving the quality, uh, it, it's much, much harder in most countries. And in some of the East Asian countries in particular, they do this with a lot of pressure on the students. And I was recently visiting in Singapore and a colleague uh, had in the evening to excuse herself. She says she has to uh, learn with her child for a test on the next day. And I said, well, do I remember correctly? Your child is about four years old. She said, yes, but uh, he's having a test to a higher level kindergarten. Uh, and if in, from that kindergarten, it's better to go in a better elementary school. So there's pressure all over here. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether this is where we uh, want to be aiming for, there is something to be said for, for more, more freedom as well, and probably there needs to be a, a compromise. And in Britain, probably this has to do a lot also with social class differentials. I think it's more the, the working class people who are also becoming education deniers, and, uh, and those who have educated parents themselves, they are more motivated. 
Yeah, the last question is functional causality and the education income issue. Of course, if we speak about higher education, then the content becomes more and more important. It is indeed so that in many countries, and as I've seen this for Bolivia some time ago, they are producing hundreds of hundreds of PhDs in philosophy that the country cannot absorb. That's not what, what they need, and they are lacking engineers. So the subject matter is, is very important there. Uh, but the good news is, it's, of course, it also enhances the, the capabilities in many other respects, the, the health behavior and so on, even if it does not immediately translate into a better paid job. We have many additional benefits from education. And the statistics show we recently looked uh, for the UNDP at the unemployment by level of education. And for most countries, mostly Europe, where we have detailed statistics, in every single country, including Spain, where the unemployed of unemployment of education educated people is very high, still the people with tertiary education have a significantly lower level of unemployment than the lower educated groups. And they more quickly uh, can switch to another job, they are more mentally flexible to uh, go on something else. So despite of the fact that it's in certain difficult times it does not directly translate into high income, it still is better than not being educated. Okay, alguien más? Una última pregunta por ahí. Si quieren hacerla en español y nosotros lo traducimos. Bueno, ya le escribí en inglés, entonces. So, this come to mind with the previous uh, questions, and I hope it makes sense. Uh, what could be the expectations or even the predictions? as they were presented for Singapore, uh, for the differences between city and the country. So I mean, uh, I don't know how this could be measured in Singapore, for example, uh, but in Latin America there's uh, different F effects and context, and context inner city and in comparison with rural areas. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, in Uruguay and Mexico. I do not know this for sure, but I think Montevideo is not as polarized as, as Mexico City. I'm thinking obviously in the results in education or, or, or different, um, I don't know how to say it, different qualities in education. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very important question that we haven't raised yet, is sort of the interaction between urbanization and place of residence and uh, education. In almost every country in the world, uh, of course, the education of uh, the, the urban population is higher uh, for two main reasons. The one is that the, the access to schooling institutions is easier. Uh, schools are usually not far away. And uh, the second is also that these sort of occupations that predominate in an urban setting uh, tend to require more skills, more education. Whereas uh, rural subsistence farming uh, is, is not requiring uh, too much education. And it's very difficult to uh, also in many of the villages uh, to get uh, schooling if the government doesn't build a school nearby. Even if if the parents want their children to go to school in many African contexts, the only option then is to go to a boarding school because there simply is no school nearby. So the demand does not by itself uh, create the supply of schools. Um, yeah, and, and therefore the, uh, the, in every time in history really sort of the, the urban areas have been the drivers of, of education and, and human capital. And there's an interesting dynamics, of course, also with migration. It is the, the rural to urban migration often is also a migration uh, for young people who come to get an education uh, in the urban area. And uh, it is only in the, the more developed country contexts, let's say in the Nordic countries or so, that uh, the more educated uh, then sometimes go back to smaller towns in the, in the area and, and bring back some of this human capital to the, the rural areas. And this is the, typically in a context also where the agriculture is more, more modernized and also requires skills. So uh, I don't think there is any unique uh, pattern aside to what I've uh, just explained. And it, it's clear that the, 
uh, for projections also, as you asked, the speed of urbanization is very closely linked to the speed of educational expansion. So, thank you very much, Professor, again. So, eh, bueno, muchas gracias a todos por venir. Los invito a que mañana asistan también a la segunda conferencia que tendremos por parte del doctor Sergei Sherbov sobre envejecimiento. Y, este, bueno, muchas gracias. Buenas noches. A ver. Y también la próxima sesión de diálogos, o sea, esta plática del profesor Lutz se, se colocó dentro de la serie de diálogos, la próxima, que también es en el marco de los 50 años, es sobre uso del tiempo, este, organizada con un esfuerzo muy grande de Edith Pacheco y de Brígida García. Entonces, bueno, creo que es algo, eh, también una metodología muy nueva, una línea de discusión muy interesante. Eh, entonces, pues, esa va a ser el 28 de febrero, aquí mismo también en el auditorio, ¿verdad? Y bueno, pues otra vez agradecerles, me da gusto que hayan estado aquí tantos estudiantes de los diferentes programas. And thank you again. Thank you.